ビデオ One of my favorite parts of doing episodes of Kyoto Video is not just reappraising classic anime from the past or shining a light on some retro title that I feel is overdue for some appreciation or critical skewering, but actually doing some anime archaeology and discovering the anime franchises that time forgot. So much anime spanned the decade, and that number only grows by each season. And since our collective memories only have so much capacity, it's only natural that even successful franchises slip between the cracks, especially ones that never made it over here to the States, thus denying them what could have been their one chance at a second life. Forgotten franchises are truly fascinating. They could have long-running success with years of quality material to their names and barely have any fanbase to show for it. Burus, wikis, good luck. You're fortunate if the half-finished scanlations are in a decent quality. And today's overlooked retro franchise is one that I'm a little surprised past the stupid Americans by. The Ozanari Dungeon franchise. Ozanari Dungeon is a franchise that I feel like deserves a little more historical importance than it actually has. It's a fantasy comedy series centered around a party of non-human adventurers. The silent wizard dog beastman Kiriman, the cowardly rogue cat beastman Blumen, and, leading the trio, the lunk-headed elf barbarian Mocha. Oh, and uh, there's also Esperi, a magical soul who inhabits Mocha's sword as a means to observe the trio incognito. The format of Ozanari Dungeon is one of an episodic adventure series where Mocha and her team are hired to complete quests via the local adventurers guild. These quests can range from rescuing damsels in distress to slaying evil clown wizards. But the main gag here is that their quests usually result in plenty of collateral damage and quests get logged in as unfinished as results, thereby causing them to have a reputation as the cheapest and most low quality adventurers the guild has on hand. All in all, a pretty simple conceit, but it was a successful one. It ran in monthly Comic Nora from November 1987 to November 1996, almost an entire decade spanning 17 volumes. Not only that, but it also spawned two prequel series and a sequel series, all of which were written by the original's author, Moto Koyama. In a way, I think Ozanari Dungeon can be seen as a forerunner to the popular fantasy manga and anime titles of the 1990s. Sure, Mocha lacks the giant pauldrons of that era, but its attitude of mixing lighthearted humor with epic fantasy gives the impressions that other franchises like Slayers and Dragon Half were not created in a vacuum. And yet, it's still very hard to find any fanbase for Ozanari Dungeon, at least outside of Japan, and even then it still seems pretty niche. I bet in another world, Ozanari Dungeon really became a dynamo of a franchise overseas, and Mocha would be marching alongside 90s fantasy anime icons like Lena Inverse and Deedlet. The fact that it isn't so just makes it all the more confusing when you know that the manga was popular enough to get a pretty good OVA in the early 90s. <laughs> The Lord of the Tower of the Wind, King Gazelle, has a simple request. He wishes to obtain the legendary dragon's head from the Temple of Fire, but because this request is breaking several ancient tenets, his advisor Folun has reservations. So upon being sent out by his king to find worthy adventurers, Folun decides to find the cheapest party there is as they are the ones most likely to fail on such a difficult quest. Unfortunately, the cheapest party also happens to be our protagonist, and they are itching to prove themselves on this journey. But as their party makes their journey, dealing with guitar-wielding air pirates and helping out cloistered priestesses, a devious plot appears to be unfolding. What exactly does King Gazelle want with the Dragonhead? And why exactly can the Dragonhead talk and seem to have his own agenda? <laughs> The existence of Ozanari Dungeon's three-episode OVA, also known by its full title, Ozanari Dungeon Tower of Wind, shouldn't be that surprising. 
The manga was successful enough to warrant a venture into the home video market which was still doing relatively well all things considered. But what many people may not know about this OVA, if they even know about it at all, is that it has a shocking amount of animation pedigree behind it. Sure, it may look like a typical middle of the shelf anime OVA that was more of a commercial for the source material than its own standalone product, but for reasons we'll get into in a few minutes, this somehow landed into some legendary hands. Does the surprise talent allow for this OVA to go beyond just light fantasy comedy? Well, why don't we take a look for ourselves? Okay, so to set the stage, it's 1991, the recession hasn't happened yet, so the home video market is still quite healthy, and the anime business still has plenty of money to throw around. Ozanari Dungeon's publisher at the time, Gakken, is looking to fund an anime adaptation of the manga, being that it's currently four years into its run and is still maintaining popularity. So they team up with the big time record company Toshiba EMI to bring this project into fruition. The only question is, what studio do they recruit? The answer might surprise you. Some of you might be thinking that it's highly unusual that a studio like Tokyo Movie Shinsha taking on a seemingly middle of the road anime adaptation would be well below their pay grade, but you have to remember, this is TMS at the dawn of the 90s. The studio was just recovering from the two-pronged attacks brought on by the underperformance of 1988's blockbuster Akira, its cult status overseas still being in the prenatal stages, and the very expensive and very troubled box office bomb 10 years in the making that was Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland. TMS was in no position to turn down work. If it wasn't for the fact that they had excellent working relationships with overseas animation teams on projects like Tiny Toon Adventures and Batman the Animated Series, they would have been coming down with the case of the Chapter 7s long ago. Plus, they couldn't just be the animation studio that made the best looking episodes of Tiny Toons. Sorry Kennedy, they needed to work on a project that the studio could call their own, even if it was an adaptation of someone else's work. Directing this OVA would be Hiroshi Aoyama, one of his first gigs as a lead director and one that would definitely set the tone for his future work. He was the animation director for non-anime productions like Tiny Toon Adventures, How I Spent My Summer Vacation, and Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. And if you want to know why both of those movies look so amazingly good despite being direct-to-video animated features, well, you gotta give credit to Aoyama. If anything, Ozanari Dungeon might just be a sneak preview to those future projects because Oh wow, does the animation look a lot better than I thought it would. Brief disclaimer of course, it's not particularly grand looking more than half the time, it mostly resembles that of an anime with a more than decent TV budget and it's not immune to taking the tried and true economic shortcuts, but it's all a means to lead up to that killer Sakuga moments, most of which are done in the latter two episodes. Not to say episode 1 is poorly animated, there are quite a few shots where TMS gets the stretch, such as this one during the scene where our three heroes give the aforementioned cloistered priestess a vision of the outside world, but episodes 2 and 3 both take all of that presentation up several notches. So much of the scenes, all of which were boarded by Aoyama himself, just had the spirit of both the fantasy action and cartoonish comedy and not so much in the way that one overpowers the other. There's no slacking off whether the anime has to board an entire temple collapsing into ruin, or someone making a funny face. But all of those pale in comparison to the climax of the anime, in which Lord Gazelle's evil plan is being carried out, after it is revealed that he is possessed by an evil sword spirit and Esper's nemesis Logos, just roll with it. The Tower of Wind begins to collapse all around itself as it takes the form of a giant spacecraft that can control a giant robot dragon with atomic breath. And while you're taking in what I just said, the animation of the tower collapsing might look familiar, as if it were a castle in the sky, per se. 
So if you know your anime history, which considering you're watching this show, I'm sure you do, you know that TMS, or more specifically their internal studio Topcraft, played a huge role in the founding and formation of the anime juggernaut Studio Ghibli. So it really shouldn't surprise anyone that the studio TMS recruited to assist with this animation process for Ozonari Dungeon was in fact Studio Ghibli. Check it. Not only does Ozonari Dungeon have TMS A gamers like Kazuhide Tomonaga, Toshihiko Masuda, and Yoshinobu Michihara credited as key animators, but also TMS alumni turned Ghibli mainstays like Atsuko Tanaka along for the ride. And to top it all off, you got Hayao Miyazaki's mentor himself, Yasuo Otsuka, doing the layout work. It's like the Sherlock Hound reunion we never got. But even without Ghibli's helping hands, Ozanari Dungeon as an anime production feels uniquely TMS in its quality. With the way the characters move and how designer Minoru Maeda translated Koyama's designs, they have sort of Lupin-esque sensibilities. My only complaint visually is that Shuichi Hirata's design for the setting feels a little stock. But this is not a fault of his own. It's really more the fault of the source material setting where the kitchen sink approach to building the world of Gondawana causes it to lack cohesiveness and it wouldn't get into proper world building until much later in the series. Yes, I can excuse the sky pirate cowboy running around in a fantasy setting, but having the climax of your sword and sorcery anime take place on the set that looks ripped from a giant robot anime being produced next door is something that doesn't jive well with me. And unlike K.O. Beast, there's no inner universe justification for it. Maybe a wizard did it? Who knows. But really, the setting is not the point. What is the point, writing-wise, is showing off these funky little adventurer characters and showing them going on an adventure. If you like them well enough, you might be thinking of picking up the latest Ozonari Dungeon Tankobon and seeing what other adventures these adventurers will go on. Ozonari Dungeon is just a simple three episode story arc that is more about serving as an onboarding to the source material rather than a straight up adaptation. And given the episodic nature of the comic, that was the right call. An aspect the OVA does a good job at is familiarizing the audience with its main trio and their personalities. Mocha is a rare breed of female anime protagonist in that she has the typical intelligence of your average shonen protag. Boisterous, a big eater, tactless to the point where it's a running gag that she calls nearly every adult man she runs into, old man. But definitely shows us that she has the heart of a hero and is ready to tell the concepts of fate and destiny to shove it where the sun don't shine if it conflicts with her ideals of freedom. <laughs> Moko was voiced by Teyu Ichiryusai, who mostly specializes in young boy characters, most famous being Kinshiro's self-appointed sidekick, Abato, in Fist of the Norsar. It's a great voice for Moka, not just playing into her tomboy personality, but underlining her rough-and-tumble attitude that contrasts with her race. Huh? <laughs> Because, if you know your fantasy, having an elf be a boisterous barbarian is a little non-traditional. <laughs> Blue Men is portrayed well as the jittery little straight man, kind of being this angel on Mocha's shoulder, but most of the time just being this nervous little fella. <laughs> He was voiced by Kyoko Tongu, who does a good job, and I can't help but chuckle knowing that that's the voice of Kei playing such a squeaky toy. Mocha! But it's Kiriman who really upstages everyone with his brand of silent comedy, combined with some well-timed signboard gags that is his primary communication method. Just when you think you were about to get tired of this gag, they come up with a more inspired spin on them each go-around. Kiriman was voiced by the mangaka himself, Koyama, which might be another joke in and of itself. Outside the main trio, the other characters and their seiyus are no slouches either. Kinyu Horiuchi gives the spirit this air of authoritative mystery. Hmm. Hmm? Issei Futamata gives the character Gengar the full of himself ego that's just begging to be taken down a peg. And you can't forget the baritone legend, Daisuke Gori, as the main bad guy, Logos. 
人間を操って私の計画を邪魔するのはやめていただきたい。But that's all well and good for the cast of characters. Is the story any good? Well, it's fine. I wouldn't call it spectacular or anything, it's just perfectly fine. To reiterate, while Ozonari Dungeon is a fantasy comedy anime, it's not a wacky off the wall sort of adventure gone haywire like you would see with Dragon Half. It's more like proto slayers without the world building, mostly a straight up fantasy with some goofball comedy to provide flavor. The plot overall is pretty straightforward, but is presented in a way where each episode revolves around a unique location and associated set piece to keep things interesting, here being a fire temple, a water temple, and wind temple slash spacecraft. Sorry, not gonna get over that, pet peeve. And though it might seem to throw a lot of names and concepts your way, it's really just a quest to go pick up a MacGuffin, pick up this other MacGuffin, and deal with the main bad guy who wishes to use said MacGuffins in a nefarious manner. It's as simple as that. No twists in the plot, only the barest hints at an overarching narrative outside the anime, and the only real theme is one of screwed destiny, delivered with all the subtlety replaced with pomp and gusto. <laughs> It's not immune to flaws, however. Ozonari Dungeon is a good anime, but it never reaches the quality of a great anime. I would say that without the animation of the folks from TMS and Ghibli, this could have easily been an even more forgetful anime than it already is. There are multiple instances where our three heroes end up in some sort of jam, and then, uh oh, it turns out that Mocha's without her sword because Esperi had to go fly away on some unofficial business that doesn't even really pay off in any meaningful way. It's just a way to artificially raise the stakes and make sure Mocha doesn't progress into the plot too fast. Plus, the side characters of the priestess and her grandmother that do make appearances after their respective episodes aren't really that interesting. They are only there to show us that Mocha's teams are actually heroes and not a bunch of dumbass mercenaries. But hey, these are minor faults in an otherwise strong 6, 7 on a good day anime. All in all, it ends satisfactory. Mocha and Pal save the day, defeat the bad guy, and Logos flies away to parts unknown promising that they have not seen the last of him. And we get a nice little ending stating that the adventures of our three heroes will continue, even if they ultimately did not get paid for their job. If you find yourself wanting to see these three dum-dums on more epic quests, well then the anime has done its job. Ozanari Dungeon is really just a commercial for the source material, but it's a solid one. In spite of its standard storytelling, it's a genuinely entertaining piece of popcorn anime. Very easy to take in, which is made even easier thanks to that animation. Even on a mid-budget, those folks at TMS and Ghibli can still work their magic. If you have an afternoon free, the Ozonari Dungeon OVA is worth checking out. Even a pretty good fantasy anime based off a pretty good fantasy manga does not deserve to fall by the wayside.